Hi there, Lior Summer here, your local community emergency physician with a quick word on nasal fractures. I've seen a huge degree of variability in the diagnosis and treatment of nasal fractures by emergency medicine providers over my 20 years of practice. And I think this really reflects on the absence of training on this particular topic and on the emergency treatment of ENT diagnoses during emergency medicine training. I'd like to make a small effort to rectify that a bit by giving you my take on the diagnosis and treatment of nasal fractures in the emergency department. Now, fair warning, there aren't great studies on this topic, but there are a few reviews, but unfortunately, this is largely an evidence-free zone of medicine. So that warning aside, let's talk about diagnosis. Now, given the way the nose sticks out of the face and mine sticks out quite a bit, most nasal fractures are isolated injuries, but obviously not always. So we have to be aware and to clinically check for other associated injuries, like other more significant facial fractures, C-spine injuries, head injuries, or the often associated Friday night hand injuries. If you suspect a more complex facial trauma, then obviously imaging, most often in the form of a CT scan, is indicated. Also, if there's a significant laceration over an obvious nasal fracture, this should be considered an open fracture and managed with appropriate antibiotic prophylaxis and consultation with your local specialist, depending on your institution. But let's stick to simple, isolated nasal fractures. For the overwhelming majority of these, there is no indication for imaging. The utility of nasal x-rays in the clinical care of nasal fractures is zero. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, a non-displaced, non-clinically apparent nasal fracture really needs no active emergency treatment other than ice, analgesia, and elevation. This would be identical care for a nasal contusion. So the diagnosis of an undisplaced nasal fracture is pointless. It changes nothing. Also, remember that the nose has a large cartilaginous component. It's mostly cartilage. So a fracture through the cartilage with huge deviation is still very clinically relevant and significant. But it wouldn't show up on a plain film of the nose. So again, nasal x-rays would offer no value to these patients. So just to drive the point home, nasal x-rays are useless. Please don't order nasal x-rays to rule out a nasal fractures. The patients don't need them. In the setting of an isolated nasal fracture, a CT scan in the emergency department is rarely, if ever, indicated. In a patient who's going to undergo an open reduction, there might be a role for CT to guide surgical management. But honestly, I would leave this in the hands of the specialist who may or may not need it. There was a recent epidemiological study released in January of this year, and it found that the health care expenditures for nasal fractures have gone up about 75% in the United States in the past eight years. This despite no increase in treatment or length of stay in hospital. Almost all the increased cost was due to imaging, and almost all of that was CT scanning. From my perspective, in the emergency department setting, the best test for a clinically relevant nasal fracture is inspection by an emergency provider. And some tips for making the diagnosis. And number one, always remember to assess for the dreaded complication of nasal fractures, the septal hematoma. Remember, the nasal cartilage is dependent on nasal mucosa for its nutrient supply. And if you separate that with a septal hematoma, and it goes undiagnosed and untreated, it could result in nasal septal cartilage necrosis and a big cosmetic deformity and possible nasal perforation or septal perforation. This is really a can't-miss diagnosis. And if you see one, it needs emergent evacuation and usually packing to adhere the mucosa back onto the nasal septum and reduce the chance of recurrence. Second tip, assess the patient from two planes. And obviously, you're going to look at the patient face-to-face, head-on. Remember to take their masks off. But also, I find it very useful to look at their nose from above. The easiest way to do this is have the patient sit down and go behind the patient, have them tilt their head up, and then look down over their forehead, over the bridge of their nose to the tip of their nose. And this kind of allows you to see the subtle nasal deviation that may or may not be there. Finally, 
ask the patient and the people who they came with to assess for the deformity too. They are obviously going to know the person's face better than you. And this can be done with a mirror or with the always available selfie camera on a smartphone. The last thing you want to do is try to correct a pre-existing nasal deviation. So let's go on to treatment. And I have to admit, I love doing procedures in the emergency department. It's one of the reasons I love emergency medicine. And people ask me why I bother reducing nasal fractures in the ED. Isn't it easier to just send them to ENT or OMFS or plastics or whoever deals with them at your hospital? They can be reduced as an outpatient in a few days or a week. The thing is, the same can be said of most minimally or moderately displaced long bone fractures too, like say a distal radius fracture. Most of us wouldn't leave a moderately displaced Collie's fracture unreduced and have them follow up in a week when the swelling comes down. Most of us reduce these. And even if the patient may need a subsequent reduction or other procedure, we still reduce them. And for me, the same holds for nasal fractures. And there are a few reasons for this. First off, it's well within our skill set to reduce these fractures. We reduce lots of bone fractures and dislocations in the emergency department setting, and noses are no different. They're actually easier in some ways. Also, we have the advantage of seeing these patients before a significant amount of swelling sets in, distorting their anatomic landmarks, so we can easily assess and reduce them early. Most of us have the skills to employ regional anesthesia in helping at these procedures. Usually, for me, this means an infraorbital nerve block and an external nasal nerve block, and these are easy to do. Now, some patients may opt for or need procedural sedation for this procedure, and again, we have all the right facilities and personnel to make this happen in the emergency department. I also think that patients are much happier and more satisfied leaving the emergency department with their noses midline, facing forward rather than pointing east or west. And I know that if I were to break my nose, I would rather have it reduced early rather than walk around for 10 or 14 days with it deviated. Finally, in many centers, timely outpatient follow-up is a challenge. So leaving these unreduced and hoping that specialty care happens in a timely manner can leave patients in a lurch. If these patients have their fractures adequately reduced in the emergency department, there is less likelihood that they'll need outpatient procedures. That being said, I do always arrange for outpatient follow-up to ensure that the patients are happy with the cosmesis when the swelling and bruising settles down. So that's it. That's my rant on nasal fractures. My big take-home points are don't order nasal x-rays for isolated nasal fractures and don't be afraid to reduce a simple nasal fracture in the emergency department. Thanks again to Emergency Medicine Cases for having me on the podcast.